Okay, so first let me thank uh, Constantine and other organizers for the workshop for inviting me to speak. I will be today talking about computing homology cycles with certified geometry. Uh, the stress is on computation, but we will be dealing with the topology, whatever little topology I know. Uh, and mostly all the topology or homology which I talk about will be under Z2, simplified, uh, because most of the applications right now I know uses G2. Okay? And towards the end of the talk, I will talk about Z, but for the time being, by default, it is Z2. Okay, so let me just tell what is the problem about. <clears throat> I'm interested in computing cycles, say one dimensional cycles in some topological space. For most applications, it's some manifold or maybe simply shell complex given as a triangulations. But these cycles should be coming from the uh, homology classes, like they should be some kind of representative of basis. Uh, of the homology classes. So, for example, uh, if it is uh, purely one dimensional cycles, I am talking about H1. Why they are important? Because somehow this, the, the picture shows that we are interested in computing some kind of features in some space. And this is a feature recognition problem which comes up in many applications in different varieties, different forms. Here is one like suppose I have a molecular modeling, I would like to know or localize something that here there is a hole through which something can pass through or there is a cavity and I am sure the mathematicians will immediately recognize they are some homological features. Okay? Uh, for example, here I am really showing an image after uh, doing some processing of some brain aneurysm uh, where things have been uh, joined together which is supposed not to be. So, this is some, some kind of anomaly. And so, this kind of features, I am just showing two examples, but it comes up in many places, for example, even in CAD designs. So, suppose we have some models of some machine parts and people would like to modify them. They are prototypes. So, modifying means some features, suppose these are two small holes and they would like to fill them up. So, first uh, thing is to recognize these uh, locations where the small souls are, localize them automatically. And then again, they are related to homological features. And once I do that, then I can fill them up, create new uh, models. So, this is another application. But so, one can go on and on showing you the importance of localizing or identifying uh, features which are related to homological cycles. Well, so it's not that uh, I have been looking into it for the first time. There have been quite a bit of work. Oh, one more thing. This is very important in computer graphics. You, so you see images. Often these images on surfaces, they are parameterized uh, from plane. But before we do that, you have to flatten it up. But again, we know that flattening it up means you have to cut it along some homology, these non-trivial cycles. And so first step is to recognize them properly and actually for a good uh, uh, parameterization, one would like to have short cycles. It's not arbitrary cycles. Okay? And that's the part of my talk actually. And that's why I call it a certified geometry. So, topological cycles as I said is age old uh, in mathematics. People know how to compute the ranks of homology groups by Smith normal form. We know this uh, well known algorithm. And there have been various variations of this uh, and uh, well, I will not talk about all these uh, different ones, but people have come up with different versions, simplified this uh, basic algorithm for special cases like surfaces, volumes, all these things. And recently this even the persistence algorithm can compute the ranks of homology group for arbitrary simply shell complexes, finite. Uh, but my main goal is not compute the rank of the homology group because that's not enough for all these feature recognitions. We have to really compute the generators, but not any generators, somehow good generators. And that's what I'm calling the gener computing the generators with guarantee certified geometry. What do I, do I mean? Here is an example. Suppose this is a double torus. 
here are these four cycles which are representative or this uh, the basis basically generating the basis of for this uh, double torus but i am not interested in computing such cycles they although they generate the uh, h1 uh, what i am interested in uh, really this one so I, I would like given a triangulation I would like to compute these four cycles because they are the smallest in some sense among this the cycles which generate the basis. Okay. So this is a very op, this is an optimization problem in computation and for surfaces we knew the algorithm for some time but what I will show you that we can solve this problem for arbitrary simplicial complex this is one result I will talk about. Okay, so here is some history again for surface case the first result was given by Erickson and Whittlesey and basically that is that one result I should mention because that set up this entire uh, research work and then it is known that the general problem is NP hard uh, of course so anybody would guess that well, general problem means that P dimensional cycles in HP generating optimal basis for any P is NP hard. Okay. But P is equal to 1, it was not proved that it is NP hard. What it was shown that for surfaces, there is a polynomial time very efficient algorithm. Only thing which was not known whether it is it can be done for arbitrary simplicial complex, whether it is still polynomial time solvable. I will give you an algorithm, very simple algorithm, which it can do for arbitrary simplicial complex computing optimal H1, the basis for H1. Okay. And that is it, that is the only thing which was not solved and we solved that. Beyond that anyway 2 and above is NP hard. So this is a result by my student Jian San and my colleague Yusu Wang which uh, we had the paper in last two years back in symposium on computational geometry. Okay, that is the one problem that I am calling it optimal homology basis problem. The other problem is optimal homologous cycle problem. This problem is a little bit different, actually it is not a little bit different, you, I, you will see that it is quite different, although they are of very similar flavor. What is the problem? Again, instead of all four, suppose I have been given one cycle, suppose this is my input, the triangulation of the surface and a cycle which is say some some uh, uh, representation of one of the uh, basis, uh, one of the class in the basis. What I would like to do is to localize this surface so that in this cycle actually instead of comp within this class, I have to compute the shortest one within its own class. So basically from the red one, I have to go to this one. Now these two are different problem. Let me just tell you at the beginning for the first problem, uh, the input is the triangulation and I am asking give me the basis, the shortest basis, the optimal basis. And for this one input is the triangulation and an arbitrary cycle in some, some class, then the output should be give me the shortest one in its class. And these two are, although they are very similar flavor, they are different complex from the, even from the complexity point of view. Let me tell you why they are different. At least, okay. So again, for surface case, there are there have been quite a few algorithm, and this problem is NP hard even for H1. Although it looks like that basis problem should be harder, but no, this problem, the localization problem, is harder. Even for H1, it is NP hard. But I'll show you that for certain assumptions, if we do, then we can have a polynomial time algorithm even for this problem for H1 of course. Actually for this one no, I take it back. I uh, will show you a solution which works for HP for any P dimensions but under certain assumption I have to do that because otherwise it is NP hard. Okay, so this is the result we had in stock in 2010 with Anil Hirani and Krishnamurti. Okay. So what do we mean by smallest basis? So by smallest or optimal basis, let me just define. We, we I'm going to associate a non-negative weight with every cycle C. Okay, a non-negative weight with every cycle C. 
the weight of a set of cycles is just the sum obviously you can think about that for example if you are is one dimensional so i have to talk about only edges and triangles i don't have to go beyond that so every edge has a weight so if every edge has a weight that will induce a weight on the cycles and sum of all these weights of a set of cycles is the their sum okay and it is important that you have to have positive weights uh, non negative weights negative weights uh, we cannot handle okay and the smallest basis for hp of t is a set of p cycles with minimal weight that generate hp okay so that that's what the goal is okay you can think about that this weight i can take as the length of the edges if it is embedded in an euclidean space there is a matrix so so weight is a very general uh, uh, metric in this in this respect okay so that's the pr problem we are going to so i'm going to show you three results one is a polynomial time algorithm for as i said h1 k for any simply shell complex which is weighted and the second result is probably that is probably very uh, more interesting from the uh, application point of view what i'm going to show you that suppose you have given a manifold sampled in high dimensional uh, <coughs> sitting in uh, uh, euclidean space high dimensional euclidean space for example you can think about a, a surface sitting in 10 dimensions okay isometrically embedded in euclidean space and what i have been given a sample of that manifold not the man the triangulation itself only point data from the manifold then what i'll show you an algorithm i can approximate within certain bound of the original uh, shortest basis of this manifold from this point data by building a complex on top of it so I, could i ask about the shortest basis um, so you have a weight of an individual Cycle. So shortest basis means you add up the weights of all of the things in the basis? Okay. So yes, exactly. You add up. It's just the sum. It's a one norm. Yes. It's just the sum. So if, uh, the other algorithm, the one that finds the shortest co uh, homologous cycle, mm -hmm. you give it a, a triangulation and a cycle that it finds mm -hmm. the smallest cycle co homologous. Mm -hmm. What if you. I mean, homologous. Cycle, homologous. Uh, what if you feed it you know, a cycle algebraically? Yes. Not have to be connected or anything. Right. It's, it's if any cycle. If you feed it 10, then there's it's fine. no one. Cycle it's fine. That's so you, you feed it a cycle from any class, okay. right? right. You, you, it could be the sum of many. Right. It will find within that class the shortest. Okay. There is no restriction being connected or anything. Okay, so the second one is an approximation because I have been given a point data in high dimensions sampled from a manifold, smooth manifold then I can really approximate the original shortest H1 uh, basis. Uh, this is very useful actually because, because you have high dimensional point data sample from manifold like manifold learning theory. Okay. So let me just, so here is an example. We have implemented this algorithm actually and I am just showing, these are the point data but not high dimensional point data only three dimensional point data sample from surfaces and from this point data we have co computed the cycles they are the smallest and I should not say smallest they are the cycles which are approximating the smallest of the original manifold okay and so so the for, for this one the input is a triangulation for this one input is a point cloud output is all these cycles. Okay, and the third one I just said the homologous problem. So these the, these are the three results I'll be talking about today. Okay, so what we can do first, I show how we do this shortest basis of a simply shell complex in order n to the power four time, where n is the size of the complex. That is, n is the number of vertices, edges, and triangles. I have to only focus only up to two two complex because beyond that h one doesn't recognize okay so so if n is this size we can do n to the power fourth time okay and then i'll show you that this can be improved now we know how to do it like order n to the power 2.373 whatever this matrix multiplication complexity is okay so 
the main tool we are going to use that to recognize since we are assuming z2 h1 is a vector space it's under field it's a vector space and it happens to be that there is a very nice metroid theory some algorithm from metroid theory i can now apply to this vector space which is called the greedy algorithm and this greedy algorithm before i do tell you the greedy algorithm let me just define what is a greedy set suppose i have been given a set of cycles l okay a grid a greedy set G out of L is a order set of cycles which are chosen from L satisfying the following two conditions. The first one C1 is the smallest cycle in L which is non-trivial in H1. Okay? So, yeah, you have been given a set of cycles C, C1 up to CK, you choose the smallest one which is non-trivial in H, H1, okay? non-trivial cycle. Then you do just iteratively the greedy way, choose the CI plus 1 which is the smallest from the remaining one which is independent from the rest which you have already chosen. So, that is the greedy, greedy approach as the greedy algorithm and it happens to be that since it is a vector space like if I can choose such a, such a sequence that is the smallest basis for each one. Okay? So, we have to somehow make sure that first of all, so I have to make sure I have to choose a set L from k which contains at least a smallest basis. I have to make sure that once I make sure that then I apply the algorithm in a greedy way to choose g so that it becomes the smallest. That is the very essence of how to do it. Now, the question comes how to make it efficient because if you do it naive way the complexity goes up. So, all these things will come into picture. Okay, so, how do I choose a set of cycles first? which I am guaranteed to have a, a smallest basis. There could be more than one smallest basis because of the weight could be, it may not be unique. But I need to have a, need to choose a set of cycles which are guaranteed to have one smallest basis. Here is a simple way to do that. We know in computer science how to compute a shortest path tree. So, you look into the one skeleton of the simplicial complex K and choose any vertex say P and compute from the point P a shortest path tree is very important to compute shortest path and shortest path with respect to the weights on the edges with respect to which I will be computing the smallest cycles. So, compute this shortest path t for example, here is the point p and I am computing this, this is the shortest path t for example. Now, for any other edge e, if you put it you we all know that it will create a cycle. Any edge e it will create a unique cycle uh, within this tree. And I am calling this, so this is the, okay. so that, that unique cycle I am calling the uh, canonical cycle for the edge E. And I collect all the set of canonical cycles for this tree T, which are given by what I just explained. For every edge E, it, it, there is a unique path, with, with, unique two paths with a common root and that is the cycle you create. So, you compute all these canonical cycles for a given tree T rooted at a vertex p. And one of the main th thing you can show the following thing that suppose you collect C p be the set of all canonical cycles over all vertices p. Okay? So, this is, a, this, is, this is quite a large set actually and then you can prove that this set contains a smallest basis. Okay? So, so, so definitely I have a now al algorithm I compute all this shortest path tree from every vertex. Actually, you can do all pair shortest path. There is a very efficient algorithm, n cube algorithm known. You can do that and compute all these cycles. And then all from these cycles, now you apply the greedy algorithm. So, but I, what I will do, I will cut down this complexity a little more because this is a quite a large number. What you can show even a little something, a smaller set also can uh, satisfy the property. Suppose for, for a set C p which is base rooted at point p, you can compute a greedy set G p out of C p. So, instead of collecting all cycles in C p, what I do individually I collect the greedy set from C p and then take the union and then apply the greedy set on the smaller set and that is it. So, all this, so this algorithm works and you can prove that everything is right and this algorithm uh, what it, why the n to the power fourth term is coming let me just tell you 
you can the main main culprit is the independence check. So, when you are doing this uh, greedy algorithm, you collect the next one, you can sort the cycles that is sorting algorithm, but the, how do you check whether the, this new one is independent with the other. So, independence check is the main time consuming part and that you, we can do using the persistence algorithm for example, but there are many other ways to do it, but uh, we can apply. So, that will be n cube, but you do it for every p. So, there is another n factor roughly that is why it is n to the power 4. Okay. But if you can cut down on the complexity of this independence check, you will improve this algorithm. And that we just found out last year how to do it very efficiently, how to compute uh, independence uh, check given a set of cycles. If you bring in another, whether it is independent or not, you can do it very efficiently, not only for one cycles, for any general dimensional uh, cycles. And so that that is the algorithm which you can do which I am calling at least by annotation. So, so this is the technique uh, which might be familiar to you, those who are familiar with homology and cohomology. Actually, we are exploiting the cohomology here, but I do not need to know cohomology to explain what it is. Okay. So, what it is, I am calling it as an annotation for p simplex is a function. You take a p simplex, so it is from the pth chains to a vector of g elements. Okay. So, so, because g is the rank of h p. So, if g is the dimension of h p for each simplex I will generate a vec g, vec g length vector. Okay. So, since it is g 2 it will be like 0 1 the elements will be zeros and 1s. Okay. Such that this has this will be true that any 2 p cycles which are homologous if and only if, if you sum the vectors over all the simplices of the two cycles, they have to be same. Okay? So, it is if and only if. So, if I make sure that such, uh, such annotation A, this map can be computed, I am fine, because what I can do using this, now give me a cycle, I will just compute its annotation, I will know immediately whether it is trivial or not or what is its coordinate in terms of the previous ones you have chosen as an basis. Okay. And it turns out, so here is an annotation for a simplicial complex. Like suppose I have a simplicial complex, oh this is not showing somehow, uh, this is this is filled, this is, there is a triangle here, there is a triangle here, there is a hole, there is a hole. Okay. So, you can see this complex has like h 1 has dimension 2 like there are two holes. Okay. So, let us see. So, then my annotation would have two bit vectors and that is what I have generated here. So, remember this is fill, this is fill like this edge has annotation 1 1, this is 0 1 0 0 1 0 everything else is 0 0. And you can see for example, this cycle should be a trivial cycle because this is filled by a triangle and if you add them up, you get the vector 0 0. For example, this cycle should be a non-trivial cycle and if you add them up, it is 0 1 because this cycle represents the this, this part of the basis like there are two bases. The first one is this one, second one is this one. So, this is an annotation for this simplicial complex and you can do you can compute such annotations and once I compute this annotation for once, then no matter how many times you give me, I just give you the sum, done. That is why it is very efficient and you can do compute such annotation quite efficiently and those of you who are familiar with cohomology, what it is doing actually is the following. Suppose you have a, this co-cycles phi i from 1 to g is a set of co-cycle generating HPA pH pH cohomology, then the annotation is nothing but its evaluation on the simplices. That is what it is. So, effectively actually I am giving you an algorithm and this is if and only if again and remember there is no unique annotation, there could be many annotations, because it depends on the basis you have chosen with respect to which you are doing the annotations. There are many, there could be many, but I am happy with one because anyone will give me the result which I want. And effectively I am giving you an algorithm which can compute the cohomology. 
these annotations also will give you a cohomology, a representation of the cohomology. Okay, and the algorithm which we have, so what it does for a simply shell complex with n simplices annotations we can compute order n to the power omega time where n to the this omega is the matrix multiplication uh, time which is less than t 3. Definitely using say simple uh, Gaussian el elimination or even persistence algorithm I can give you these annotations. But if you are worried about the theoretical complexity well here is one which is eff efficiently can be done. Okay. And let me just tell you in my opinion it is not a very straightforward application of, of persistence or the matrix multiplication. We had to go over some hoops. Okay. Maybe there is something simple, but at least we, we did not find. There are certain things you have to still do. Okay. So, this is a new result. We have not yet, well, it is not published yet, but it is on our web pages. Okay, so, so what happens is that using these annotations, now I can do the independence check much faster for my shortest basis problem. So, that is why the shortest basis now can be solved instead of n to the power 4, n to the power 2.3 something. Plus, there are sub certain terms which comes from other parts. So, here is the actual complexity of the shortest basis algorithm. So, shortest basis H1 can be computed well compute the annotation this is n to the power of omega and then this part comes because of the independence check where n square, but remember most of the application g is really small. So, anything g to the power is g is the rank of the homology group generally it is 5 or 6 or 7. So, anything if you cut it down from n to the power to g to the power is, is a big gain actually in terms of practice. Okay. And so, this from for the all practical purposes should be mostly n to the power 2.3.37. Okay, so, that is my first one. Now, let me go to the second part of my uh, second result which I promised is the approximation from the point cloud data. So, what is the setting here? I have a set of points P in R D which is sampled from a smooth closed manifold A M sitting in R D embedded. So, so that is my assumption. Okay. This has been sampled from a smooth closed manifold. Okay. If you are, if you have been given, what do we want to do? We want to approximate the smallest basis of H 1 A M from P. That is my goal. Okay. So, definitely I have been given only a point set P. I cannot do anything on a only discrete point set. So, I have to build a complex on top of it. So, we build a complex K from P and what I do now? Once I compute this complex properly under the assumption that P is sufficiently dense, I will tell you in a moment the, what does it mean. Then I apply the previous shortest basis algorithm on K. I know the, how to do that and then prove that this whatever you have computed does really approximate the original base, basis and that is the algorithm then. Okay. So, that is what it is. So, what is the complex I am going to do? Probably most of you know is the Vietor is RIPS, which I am calling as RIPS complex. What is the RIPS complex? So, it takes a parameter r on a point set P. You join any two vertices or any two points which are at a distance less than or equal to r. I am talking about the Euclidean distance here. So, any two which are within a less than r distance join them. So, you get a graph. Now, you complete this graph with this flag uh, simplices which are nothing but if there are all the faces of a simplex then fill that throw in that simplex iteratively or recursively. So, for example, these three edges are there then I will th throw in this triangle, these three edges are there I will throw in this triangle. So, this is the Rips complex of this point set with some parameter r. So, given the point set you build this Rips complex with some parameter r that is the catch you have to somehow figure out which parameter it is. But once you have chosen the parameter r rightly or correctly then if you compute the shortest basis in this simplicial complex that is it it will comp approximate the original basis and exact form. So, here is this uh, like we have implemented this. So, this is the point cloud data from this manifolds we build the Rips complex 
with some parameter r and just compute the shortest basis and this shortest basis will approximate the original ones. Well, yes, but uh, yes, it it turns out to be. But our alg our requirement is also that your point sample is dense. I cannot guarantee anything if it is not. Okay, so let me just tell you the theorem what we could prove. This is the theorem and the approximation quantitatively. What do we mean? Okay, so first of all, m is the manifold. Why did I switch to k? I don't know. This is g actually the k the rank of h one of m. Now, there is a parameter r I have to choose to build the complex and this r has to be related with the sampling density p. What is the sampling density? For any point on the manifold, assume that there is a sample point within epsilon distance. I will call it as epsilon sample of the manifold. Okay? And if this epsilon is one, one eighth of these two quantities, what are these two quantities? rho of m is the reach of m reach of m is basically if you if you think the medial axis of the manifold is a smooth closed manifold i can talk about medial axis well defined concept and the distance from any point to the medial axis the smallest distance from over all the point take the infimum over all the point that's the reach okay that's an intrinsic quantity of the manifold okay so your sampling density somehow has to be lower than Oh, one eighth of whatever that some fraction of reach that is one, one thing. Then I we also need somehow this quantity rho c of m which is the convexity radius of m. Uh, convexity radius is basically for any point if you take a geodesic ball and it, it, the convexity radius is the infimum of all the radii the geodesic radii for which it remains to be a disk roughly. So, this is again this is a well defined complex uh, concept in differential geometry in uh, so there is this injectivity radius there is this convexity radius. So, I am just claiming that if your sampling p is dense enough satisfying this condition that this epsilon is one fourth over this and then if your r is chosen within this range then everything is fine but what is everything is fine means the following thing what is the suppose l is your smallest length length of the smallest basis on the original manifold m then what we guarantee whatever we compute the set of loops here its length will be upper bounded by this and lower bounded by this and if you examine the lower bound and upper bound what is it saying if your epsilon is approaching to 0 so, epsilon is approaching to 0 means you are basically sampling the manifold densely denser and denser. As you do that, then length of g actually from lower and upper it, it coincides. Okay. So, that that is what it is. Now, you may wonder that how can I choose epsilon and r to be both going to 0 because r is on the denominator. What you can do? You can choose r to be a little bit larger say square root of epsilon and then everything is fine and you need to do a little bit more because otherwise things do not work out. And do you have to assume that the samples are actually on M or yes, 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 on M right now on M, but extending it to the noisy part like when you have say some Gaussian noise or something that part should not be that difficult like right now we know enough about this point cloud sampling that we can plug it in probably, but we did not just do it. Why did not I use injectivity radius? Instead of using that rule, can you talk about minimum homological critical value? Ah, right now I do not know. No, I do not think so. At least I do not know. The proof uses this fact quite, quite like this rho c, the proof uses it quite heavily. So, homological critical value that will be much more relaxed. Probably not because here somehow you have to do this uh, house of distance. This is another part like the whatever I compute there is a the house of distance is also bounded they are close and if you do not I do not think you can do that, but um, well I do not know. 
but that will be nice if we could, because then the sampling requires requirement is much less. Okay, so maybe now I talk, come to the last uh, part of our talk, the last result. Now I'm switching. Now the homologous cycle. Now, now the input is the triangulation and a cycle in any class. I'm now trying to localize it. Okay, that problem. Oh, I know that even for H1, it is NP hard. There is no way I, if that proof was correct, I would not be able to uh, find any polynomial time algorithm unless P is equal to NP. Okay. So, what we did, and this is a little bit surprising to me, I was talking to uh, Constantine in the morning that here we all, everybody believe, uh, at least whomever I have talked to, even I believe that Z2 is always easier than Z. Here is something you will see Z is better for computation than Z2. It's a little, uh, to me it's a little surprise. But. Okay, so the problem is this, given this, okay. So OHCP, this problem is NP hard if Z2 is the coefficient which is used. What if, what if we switch to Z? It turns out then this problem you can solve with linear programming under certain condition of course. And we know linear programming is polynomial time solvable. So my, our basic thing is to convert the problem to a linear programming problem and then show that well, it achieves exactly the same thing. Then I, I'll use the linear programming solution, which is polynomial time. And it happens to be that Z, under Z2, I cannot do that. Under Z, I can do. Is that linear programming or integer linear programming? Ah, I'm coming. Okay. I'll t actually, it will be integer linear programming. Then we'll prove that under certain condition, ILP becomes LP. So you just solve LP. And you, it will give you integer solution. Okay, are the solutions integral? Yes, if the, if the con constraint matrix for the linear programming satisfies certain condition, which is called the total unimodularity. I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. Okay, so a matrix is totally unimodular, which I call it a TU, or not I, it is a well known concept actually in, from operation research or optimizations. If the determinant of each submatrix is 0, 1, or minus 1, that's the condition. You take any square submatrix of the matrix, if the determinant is either 1, minus 1, or 0, then you call it totally unimodular. Okay, now, so first of all, this is known, this is well known from the optimization theory that if A, the matri constraint matrix, is M, M by N totally unimodular matrix and B is an integral vector, then the polyhedron, like this the polyhedron, the boundary you think about, this polyhedron is integral. Every point on the polyhedron has to be integral. If this is totally unimodular, A is unimodular and B is an integral vector, okay? This is known. This is not uh, something we discovered, okay? So now you can see that since it is tot integral, means where, if I satisfy this condition, then even LP will find an integral solution. So, so here is the optimization version. First, let, let us consider the following, following optimization, the integer linear program. Suppose I have an integral vector B, M dimensional, and a real vector F, and then I'm, I'm just trying to do this optimization, minimize, F transpose X, okay, subject to this condition, X is equal to B, where X are all positive, and X are integral. Suppose this is my optimization uh, problem, okay. So definitely this optimization problem is an integer uh, linear program because you can see that this is, I'm asking for integer solutions. So. A corollary is if A is totally unimodular matrix, then this integer linear program can be solved by in polynomial time because you can use LP, OL. Now our task is to write the OHCP problem in terms of the 
integer linear ILP version, integer linear program and then show under what condition, topological condition this matrix A satisfy this total unimodular condition. And surprisingly somehow from uh, operation research this was known from topology nobody uh, connected to this and we, we just made a connection from topology to this uni, total unimodularity. And it turns out to be, it turns out to be quite a natural characterization and maybe there is more things to be done we are still exploring. Okay, so, so let us see. Suppose assume that the complex K contains m p simplices and n p plus 1 simplices. I am worried about computing the localization in H p, p dimensional uh, cycles. Okay. So, I am considering p simplices and p plus 1 simplices and w is the weight. So, every simplex has a weight associated with it. So, I am I can think about is a diagonal m cross m matrix obtained from the weights on the simplices. Okay. So, now my problem if you recognize, so what, what are the input to me? Given an integer value p chain c, that is my input cycle. Actually right now I am going to solve not only localization of a cycle, localization of any chain, but cycle is a uh, restriction of that. So, if I solve this more general problem I am done. So, instead of cycle I am saying take the input chain p chain c, now the problem to solve is this. You minimize, so remember x is the one which I am going to find out, x is the variable, the, the, the values of the p chain. Okay. So, that vector I have to find out. So, you, you basically uh, basi this is the one norm of this, you sum the sum the all the weights, that is what this guy will do, you minimize it under the condition that x is homologous to c, but homologous to c means c plus do the boundary operation on a p plus 1 chain y, but this boundary operation is given by this matrix p, p plus 1 boundary matrix. So, apply this p plus 1 boundary matrix on some p plus 1 chain, this is given x should be sum of these two. Okay, that is my constraint and of course, another constraint is x has to be integral and y also has to be integral. I am going to find x and y given c through this integer program. Okay. Now, still the main problem is this is not actually integer linear program. It is an integer program, but not linear because of this guy here. There is a mod sitting there and mod sitting there is not linear. So, you can do a trick now. The trick is to do the following. You split the variables x is into positives and negatives, x plus because some of them will be positive, some of them will be negative. So, I am denoting as x i plus, x i minus and take this value, take the positive value, just multiply them and look at this, I have switched the signs because this, these are the negatives and that is what it is and then you require that both x plus and x mi minus are greater than or equal to 0 and of course, the, the integer constraints here. But as I told you, if I can show that the, the constraint matrix which are coming from this constraint here, if it is totally unimodular, I can drop the integer constraint. Now, it becomes say linear program. I can now apply my linear programming and solve it in polynomial time. That is what it is. So, now it is quite powerful because what we are doing is not only one p dimensional any dimensional chain not only cycles it is any dimensional chain give me a chain I will give you an optimal chain in, in its own class. Okay, class means well, the difference is, is a, is a p, uh, p plus 1 chain. Okay. Now, Okay, so, these are now you can see that basically you, you can think about the actual constant matrix will be this identity minus you just switch it around on this side the a x ultimately you have to write a x is equal to c okay, which will be nothing but this is the matrix, but it is known that if b the original boundary matrix is totally unimodular so is this one. So, our main thing is to prove that the or the condition is the original boundary matrix is totally unimodular. 
OK, so that's what it is. And this is the theorem. OK, now where can you apply this? So, be, uh, <laughs> well, uh, so basically you can compute in polynomial time, which I'm just claiming. If your boundary matrix LP1 is totally unimodular, you can solve this problem in polynomial time. OK. Which polynomial? Oh, this polynomial time. This is the NQ. You can do it in NQ. There is a, because the matrices are very, only zeros and ones. What, what I can, I can put that all the variables xi are between zeros and ones. You can put that and then it, it, it is only NQ for that input. Otherwise, if you apply, if you allow any integers, then it is polynomial, but then the bit complexity comes into the picture. In the input bits, how many bits you require to, because that's the well known fact for uh, LP. Okay. Now, the one may ask the question that, well, how, what is, why is it useful that this totally unimodular constraint, maybe no, no, no interesting thing satisfy that, then, well, you have a theorem, uh, not useful theorem. Here is one which satisfy this theorem that for a finite simply shell complex which triangulates a p plus one dimensional compact orientable manifold, we know that is this is TU, no matter how you have oriented it. So at least for man, orientable manifolds, I can use this for arbitrary uh, dimensions. So give, for suppose you have a triangulation of an orientable. You can use it at the second highest degree. Right? Yes, right. I cannot do, because, they, because uh, then it is no more a manifold. So that's why it breaks down there. Okay, so that's one one way to. Well, this is corollary is basically saying the same thing, that it is polynomial time solvable. The second one, okay. Now here is a topological characterization. Probably this is interesting from the topological uh, point of view. A pure simply shell complex of dimension p is a simply shell. Okay, so I'm just giving you what is a pure simply shell complex. Basically, it's the simply shell complex coming from only p simplices. Mean there is no uh, lower dimensional simplices which are not adjoining any p simplices. That's what a pure p simply shell complex. Okay, a pure subcomplex is a subcomplex of this. And here is the main one of the main theorem we proved that this boundary matrix will be unimodular if and only if this relative homology, okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you what is this relative homology is, is p-dimensional relative homology with respect to L and L0 is torsion free. Actually it happens that is the torsion which is the main culprit in somehow doing this integer linear program or forcing us or, or obstructing the linear program is the torsion and torsion in the in the relative homology and what are the relative homology you have to take all pure subcomplexes of l0 and l where l0 is of dimension p l is of p plus 1 dimension take all such pairs and check whether this hp of this relative homology is torsion free or not if all of them are torsion free one can prove that this has to be totally unimodular Okay. And so, so this is a topological condition which if it is valid, then we know we can solve the linear programming, this problem using the linear programming. Well, again, so this is saying the same thing uh, that it can be solved in polynomial time. Now, here is a particular case where I know that this topological condition is uh, satisfied. Suppose you have a finite simply shell complex in R d plus 1. So, a 3 complex in R 3. Yeah, so 3 complex in R 3. Then I know if H, I know that H 2 of L L 0 is torsion free for all pure subcomplex. This, this is true. For any 3 complex in R 3, H 2 relative homology is torsion free. So, I know at least for 2 cycles, I can now apply my algorithm and get the optimal cycles. And this proof we have given it uses again homo cohomology and homology, Alexander uh, duality. We are using that fact here actually, okay, it is in the paper. 
okay so this is this is another case where you you now this is you can see that this is a little bit more general from the previous one previous one we had manifolds now no matter whether it is manifold or not this is simply shell complex but i cannot go beyond beneath this because then the, it's not torsion free in general it's not well so this is uh, the corollary and I guess now I am going to show you some pictures uh, again we have implemented in R3 right now we are still working on it uh, particularly for three complexes how to do it uh, more efficiently because that is the most applications are and we believe there is something else we can do for three complexes. Okay, here is basically well. This is the complex. This is the cycle given. We computed this using this. Uh, this is the cycle which was given. It localized to this. What, uh, how long did these computations take? So A linear program, whatever. Uh, no, so but I mean, here you have some actual calculations. Is that uh, so this is like no, 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 no. A couple of seconds. Yeah, right. On a, on a Minute laptop. maybe on a laptop. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's not. But again. All these things it depends on how efficient linear programming you are using, and there are various stages of linear heuristics of uh, linear programming code. So we, use, I think, my student use one of the codes, not the most efficient one. And the main problem is that it's not the time; it's the problem of handling large data size. Like say, say we can handle fifty thousand points, hundred thousand points. Beyond that, linear programming cannot handle. That is the main bottleneck although these are not 100,000 in that range. Okay. So, for example, this is interesting. Look at this. There is a cycle here, but it, it, in its class, it found out this two because these are the two in its class and this is the shortest one and it can detect such things. Is that a cat or a pig? <laughs> whatever, whatever you think. <laughs> so, I think it is a pig. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I think it is. It was a pig. I know. <laughs> so well. So this was the, just the validation that our thing is correct. <laughs> okay. So what we have done, we have given uh, an efficient algorithm for optimal homology basis problem for simplicial complexes. Can it further? Can it be further improved? Like I would like to have a n square algorithm and apparently I think we can do it for three complexes. Now I know how to do it. It took me at least took me a while to cut it down for this special case, but I am very happy to work with three complexes because many applications comes in three complexes. And so the solution right now I have works only for three complexes, but that is that's fine. Means I, again I use the Alexander duality quite heavily there. Okay, so this code is available uh, if you want to play with the code list, uh, the shortest basis code. And unless you really give it a very large data set, it will be reasonable. Uh, if you give it a large data set, it will be taking more time. But this, this code, uh, we are planning to improve it very soon. Well, the, again, I told you this order, as Bob has asked, this is order n cube algorithm for linear programming, but it does not say that that is the way you have to do it. It has already, uh, we have already shown that this can be solved in polynomial time. Maybe there is a completely new way of solving it, which will require less than n cube. That will be very interesting uh, to see if that can be done, at least from the computer, computer science point of view. And what about efficient updates? So, so, so all these problems I showed you like static version, like your simplicial complex is static, input is static. Suppose I now constantly change, can you update efficiently? And that's that's the scenario in applications many times. I do not know how to do it other than other than using incremental version of linear programming. I do not know how to do anything better. So these are the questions so one can ask. Um, thank you. I think I, I would finish it here.